Flossy, and that's uh, basically a group that uh, Paula set up for women in open source. So, uh, and uh, I know that throughout the time I've known her, Paula has been uh, making sterling efforts to get more women involved in open source. So, uh, Not so much no, actually. It's, uh, I feel a lot of, um, we have really made a lot of progress. No, I know, but, <laughs> so we are still, uh, first uh, through uh, Flossie and BCS Women, we did these uh, uh, taster days in open source for women. So I'll turn the uh, floor over to you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, Corey and I were both involved in uh, FOSSI, which was uh, an annual conference we ran for a couple of years. And we were yeah. um, <laughs> we're starting to thinking about <laughs> what we're going to start doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the idea of it initially was to um, try to make environments in which women could take themselves seriously as coders without fear of um, uh, not being taken seriously. And we started out like that, but we began to get more interested in um, how different areas of tech fit together because women tend to get, um, it was quite interesting what you said, Andrea, about uh, how certain areas of technology become associated with women and, and considered less hard, um, you know, soft sort of uh, alternatives. So we were interested in how those fit together as well. Um, this presentation is a little bit out of date, uh, I'm recycling. Um, but I'm going, and I can't read it also because this. Just click yeah. down with the keys. Oh, sorry. Read it? Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. So basically, I think um, one of the things that I did, I wrote this not that long after Floss Polls had come out, well, actually, probably a few years after Floss Polls had come out, but there was an enormous flurry of research after 2009 for some reason, sort of watershed year, and there was a massive amount of research going on into. Um, into women in open source in particular, women in technology in general. And there are as many explanations for it as you can shake a stick at. Um, and it's impossible to resolve, and I think as, as you're experiencing, it, it just is so emotive that it's probably best not to open your mouth on the whole. So we started thinking in terms of solutions, that let's just focus on how to change it, really. And one of the things that became obvious in that period after 2009, um, the couple of years of, of intense activity around addressing gender equality, is that actually if you make an effort to involve women, women will get involved. It's really that simple. You, you have to actively discourage women, um, and, and a fairly small amount of active encouragement of women will result in gender balance projects. And that was the experience in uh, the USA around that time. So. The question then becomes, um, how do you encourage women? And I put these pictures in, mainly to brighten the place, aren't <laughs> That's one of the workshops. We started using arts as one of the ways, because women feel comfortable and empowered and, and authoritative around art and craft and all of those areas. So we started using art practice as a way into, so women um, were learning coding as part of digital arts projects or making or, you know, there was also the kind of heyday of uh, making and fab labs and this kind of thing. And what started to occur to me is that there were a lot of problems around the sort of fab lab and innovation because obviously we're getting into catapults and innovation by then. And the actual cultural model around innovation was becoming as sort of gender loaded as, as models around coding. Um, the sort of heroic billionaire model caused a lot of um, eyebrows raised in uh, Tech City because uh, Tech City did a, um, a video to promote Tech City and it featured a couple of 20-something um, young men rolling about in money um, with the obvious reference to Silicon Valley and this is basically what the government would quite like you to do. And obviously, well, I mean, maybe it's not obvious, but when women watch this, they just go, <laughs> you know, women don't identify with the heroic billionaire model of, of innovation. And it began to um, become increasingly obvious at around that time that actually Silicon Valley is, is, and it's now more and more obvious that we're looking at innovation plateau now and, and a degree of market saturation. And that model of innovation is 
not what it used to be. And that actually, it, it began to dawn on me that diversity can be, uh, it should, shouldn't be treated as a problem anymore, but as a solution that not enough people are, are availing themselves of. So, a lot of work was done, as I'm sure you all know, with open source in developing countries, particularly around areas like banking and communications. And very different ways of coming at things began to emerge in different contexts. And it is also becoming increasingly obvious, um, a friend of mine does um, big data and she hails from Ethiopia where China obligingly uh, metal all the roads which then became unusable three months out of the year because they were breast deep in water. Because they didn't run off the way the old mud roads had, you know. So it's increasingly obvious that you can't, that the Silicon Model Valley, the Valley Model doesn't necessarily travel even to the UK, much less um, into more diverse environments. And actually, even for industry, it's necessary to start looking at diversifying out of that consumer um, boys and their toys 18 to 24 demographic. It's saturated. And it is also plateauing in terms of innovation because we're reaching the uh, limits of, of what processes can do, etc., etc. So in order to kind of diversify and, and uh, continue to innovate, um, it's necessary to uh, explore new ways of doing things. So it's one of the things that Flossie was quite interested in, and um, we tried in various sort of relatively lame ways that didn't always work to um, try to bring together. Because what well, the way it kind of does, because originally when we talked about, hey, let's do a, a conference for women in open source, the first objection that occurred to all of us was, oh, that'll be three women then, won't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we kind of thought, how can we reach out to more women and get more women involved? And that's really how Flossie came to find by reaching out and getting more women involved. And one of the things that we realised is that actually, if they get a chance to deal with other women involved in any kind of technology, <coughs> women will come. So that kind of seemed to be quite a good uh, place where you can actually bring together different people and see what happens. And um, there was just some amazing conversations where, for example, we had a woman who does making. She was using um, uh, electronic um, wire to knit, to knit, uh, and they've done some workshops getting women involved in tech because they were happily um, knitting uh, yarn off Arduinos and this kind of thing. And there's also uh, another woman who's um, BCS Women who's done uh, an incredible sort of cross-industry platform which enables people to test properties of new um, synthetic yarns um, virtually before blah, blah, blah. That's, you know, that's open source and yarn and vast sort of academic, hugely funded project. And the t I actually introduced two of each other to each other drinking tea and, and one of them said, oh, well, what do you do? And she says, oh, well, um, uh, I, I work with yarn and the other one says, oh, do you sort of knit jumpers or <laughs> No, not exactly. You know, I revolutionised the industry, um, you know, synthetic fibres. So it was kind of a way, gender became a way of bringing together all these diverse people <coughs> and learning from each other and kind of getting ideas of, oh, we never thought of that. Um, diversity, again, I think it's really important that one of the things that we started to talk about in the second Flossy conference is that there was a lot of discussion about whether we should be women only. And what emerged from that is that actually, really, what diversity is an important question throughout technology, actually. Um, certain class um, origins or education backgrounds were overrepresented as well. Um, whilst there was really strong representation of uh, people from developing countries or, or refugees or immigrants or whatever, um, there were issues about how they were expected to adapt their culture. And some of the women, that, this particular group of women that you're looking at now, were students in the um, electronic and uh, computer science department at Queen Mary. And we got um, emails from a couple of them saying that they were close to dropping out of their course when they'd encountered Flossie. And the chance to be with so many diverse women um, and to talk to other women and just be engaged just had completely transformed their experience of studying technology. So we kind of wanted to move away from the question of why is this and move towards what to do. 
So one of the things that we did is, is uh, one of the projects that Cornelius is about to revive, um, which is the philosophy skill sharing um, and career taster workshops. Because one of the things we found, there's a big theory about the leaky pipe, that women drop out, have babies and can't get back in. So we decided to sort of um, see if we could <laughs> <laughs> to see what we could do about this. Um, and we ran a three-day career taster first at um, the Museum of Computing and then at BCS to not only refresh code skills, but also what I remember about coming back after having a child myself was I was looking through the job list and thinking, what the hell is that job? <laughs> I don't even know what that bloody job is. So we had people come and talk about their current career structures and how career structures are currently working. Um, to look at contemporary coding, um, to refresh skills, and generally try and get women back in. And actually, we did this for free because we thought that most of the women coming would be skinned. But in fact, we found about half the women at the um, Museum of Computing had actually been sent there by their employers to um, pick up new skills and, and advance their careers. So this is something that actually we really should have done much more of, but we didn't get around to thinking about a sustainable model. Really. Um, the other question was, there's so much stuff around, uh, you know, should everything be pink and have rhinestones and blah blah blah. I mean, and you take a quick look, that's actually eclectic tech rather than flossy, but there's many of the same women involved. Um, women in tech, you know, really range from people who've been pulled backwards through a hedge, as my mother used to say, to, you know, like women in heels with, uh, you know, rhinestone pink bags and, you know, it's the whole, all of human life is there. Um, but designing tech for women is a little bit more complex than uh, sticking rhinestones on it. Um, which is one of the things that I'm most interested in because my background is design through research. So that was an area that I particularly wanted to develop. And it was great for me to be with women who were systems engineers or uh, you know, um, industrial coders, that kind of thing. So I kind of ended up with this, the, the idea that Problems with partial solutions added to diverse inputs, um, which means coders, innovators, artists, local communities, entrepreneurs, researchers, data wranglers, if you kind of get all those people into a space, they can't understand a word that each other are saying, but it's the most incredibly dynamic and, and interesting space. I spent yesterday getting a complete migraine working with um, a guy from Rolls-Royce who's doing uh, um, complex systems and talking about how we're going to um, look at future cities as a polity. And by the end of it, both of us were um, limping with exhaustion, but it was just so interesting, you know, and it, it opens up things that you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So instead of looking at diversity as a problem to be solved, we should look at it as a positive um, clash of different insights and something which can create new knowledge. Um, one of the things that we're working on now in my research network, which is about um, research through design, um, it's uh, creative computing at Sussex, um, HCI at uh, Sheffield Hallam, and um, me, I currently work for the um, Council for Higher Education and Art and Design. Um, we're looking at um, how we can bring together questions of, because one, technology is now moving um, funding focus is moving towards infrastructure development and less into consumer electronics. Um, research is heading in that direction to some extent. And I myself am really concerned about the kind of cultural and societal issues that come out of things like automated decision making and AI and smart infrastructures and future cities and those kinds of things. Um, and again, these can only be tackled by bringing together different people because the systems engineers look at me and like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, if you put in a complex system which is not just going to run railways and stuff but is also actually going to make some serious decisions about how um, things unfold in urban space, um, you can't just, you can't tell me things like, um, well we know people have five senses and that's all we need to know in order to design a complex system. <laughs> But, you know, people say something like that to me in all good faith. So I think in terms of where technology is going now, in terms of future cities and some of the um, uh, smart systems we're looking at, 
I do think there are questions that we need to think about, which are not only the Snowden type questions, but some questions about um, how society will, because at the moment society is constructed by people banging heads. And if we should there, it is basically, it's what pluralism is. You know, X, Y, Z puts in such and such a system, and people turn up with cat dogs screaming, you can't do that, right? Um, and if, if the systems become increasingly automated and increasingly removed from anything that anybody understands or can interact with, and this is not seen as a problem on all sorts of levels because people have very much have a neurology sort of idea of human beings, um, which is kind of like a little bit alarming. So we've been talking to future gov who have, are starting to get a sense of where this could, you know. And all of these things are, are greatly enhanced by diversity. I think it, you know, we need to have fewer silos and more flow. And in a way, Flossie provided us a, a conduit for that flow um, by bringing together people on the basis that they were women who were broadly and vaguely involved in this and that. And we, we're starting to think about um, widening that to different, um, different experiences of diversity. And uh, my advice is open your mind as well as your code. Mm -hmm. Having a good old fight and not being able to work out what on earth each other is talking about, all of my beer is a really good thing. <laughs> so diversity is the solution and not the problem. That's my proposition for you all. Any questions? More comments and some sympathy. The, the heroic billionaire, I suspect, is, pop, is a popular culture image because in the nature of running a small business, I go to an awful lot of gatherings for entrepreneurs. And the thing that comes across every time, right at the beginning, is whoever the wise old bird they've got opening the event is says, remember, entrepreneurs, every entrepreneur starts up their own business for their own reasons. And most of the time, it's not to make as much money as possible. It's to prove something, it's to do something. My company exists to do great engineering and have fun because it's not to make me a billionaire. You wouldn't do open source compilers if you wanted to be a billionaire. But the, the, every company seems to have its own thing. And yet, it's, one of the reasons I hate Dragon's Den is because it so stereotypes the way entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial funding goes on. It's not like that in the real world. And there's, popular culture seems to want to sort of simplify everything to some easily digested chunk that's not really grounded in reality. I think it's a teensy bit government driven. <laughs> KTN are currently under the gun to scale creative industries. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one can argue, one understands why government wants more to tax, but... <laughs> yeah, it's not only that, but they, they, yeah, yeah, they want more to tax, I guess, but yeah, they also want to... Um, Place in the, world, you know, the, world, you know, the, well, the point the point you made really right towards the end about technology. I, mean, I think I think that's pretty well. You know, what, what 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 tends to happen is obviously politicians come up with these ideas, and they just the sort of thing you're talking about is they just it's just an imposition of technology. And I, I think what what you what 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 you're, what you're suggesting there is obviously that you know more more input in, into those decisions. But um, I mean the thought just occurs to me is okay, I, I can see that. I mean I can see, you know, you could call diversity, class diversification, people making decisions. But I think there may be there's something else there isn't there in so much as um, dare I say it, you've got some of these politicians uh, are women who are in, imposing these decisions and I just wonder whether it, um, whether there was a kind of a, 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 sub, a sub sort of mindset of these type of people who wish to Im, impose um, solutions upon you, you know, it, it's not necessarily gender based. You know? No, 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 yeah, this is so, what, I'm moving yeah. away from gender as being a private person, yeah, 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 yeah. like I'm, I'm interested in power in systems now because I completely agree. I, think, I think there is a problem that um, there's a problem have a certain kind of education in believing that, genuinely believing that they know best 
basically, and I'll do that. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, back first. Okay, I, just, uh, I was going to pick up from that, is do we have a particular issue with the education system? I mean, having teenage kids and just seeing my daughter's reaction, and it's not because the school, for lack of trying, but that age, 11 to 15, is when girls... Not so far, far too many sets removed from what, what, you know, what you're talking about. And basically, she, she you know, concentrated on science and the rest of it, and she, she basically um, is, is a child civil engineer. And at the time, I mean, certainly, you know, um, I suppose it's, let's say she was at university in the later part of the 70s. I've got to say that I didn't, I didn't have any conscious thought that there was, an, I, she never communicated that, that she had any conscious problems with, uh, with doing that. Um, I think the odd girl just does it. I mean, there were certain things that I would do without a second thought, you know, that, that other girls wouldn't dream of doing. I, mean, I think there is some sort of variation. But I'm, I'm of a similar generation. I've got this sort of, yeah, sort of, sort of sideline on it. But, but I, I certainly never, I never kind of felt when I was at school in, 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 the, in the 60s and 70s. But basically, I, I, never, I, never, I never felt, and I still don't feel, that I, I, could, I could see, I don't know why, but I could... I could I can never see a gender bias, and on some respects, looking look at retrospect, I, 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 sometimes people talk about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm rather sort of taken aback at it. It's because so I, I, subtle. If, if I had a pan yeah. every time someone said to me at the age of 14 or 15, oh, you're behaving just like a man, I would not need it ever to work. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah fair enough. Yeah, well, Oh, sorry, there was something in response to that, that Andrea's chart with the men and women responding mm -hmm. yes or no to the discrimination. Um, the thing I picked up on is how you characterise these complex systems. Um, people are generally sort of retreating from them. You know, we don't understand them, they're too complex. And it made me think of the average bloke saying, oh, don't understand women, you've got too complex. Yeah. <laughs> and when, you, when you look at situations like a diverse group, it becomes that complex system again, and there's that sort of reluctance because you can't pin it down and control it in, mm -hmm. in a deterministic way. Yeah. And the, the success of that diversity approach really depends on people not being intimidated by that. Exactly, and also it's very tiring. People don't like time. Can I um, follow up with that in terms of the complexity and <clears throat> particularly like the future of design? Do you think that these people that sort of that aren't looking at the complex issues? Is it because they literally don't see them or they don't think they matter? Or is it because they're too complex and they're going for simple solutions and that's why you get it to get something else? Is it a choice they're making? I, I think that depends, that, that different environments, there are different reasons. You know, like if I'm looking at the guy from Rolls Royce, he's got a brief, he's got to deliver this in a blah, blah, blah time, he's got a methodology, his head's down and he's off. Um, in another environment, it might be that, um, you know, we don't like to, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it, it sort of it depends on. The guy who's head down and do you think do you think he's not considering the other stuff, or do you think he's considered it, decided it's yeah. not as important as the basic model? I think on the whole, he's not considered it because it's not. You know, that sort of thing at the beginning of the climate change thing. It's like, what's in your best interest to, to bother your head about? Mm -hmm. Most of us don't. You know, we've got a thing that we've got to do, and too much thinking about blah de blah will end up in you not getting really so you know you, you just sort of you know don't you, you, you know, all in the back just I'm just wondering if you have any sense of how much this is becoming some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy um, so things are changing and things are getting better but because of the perception that has been established that women now are shying away and they are not really benefiting from the change that's happening and the reason why I ask this because I was lucky enough to get involved in open source very late mm -hmm. and quite recently. Mm -hmm. Very late in my life, but been in my life, and quite recently. And my experience has been absolutely incredible. I work with a community that's very close to hardware. Mm -hmm. There are practically no women involved, most of the meetings so are just myself. And they have been incredibly welcoming, really open minded. Um, I'm a designer as well, mm -hmm. so uh, it's the first time that I've engaged professionally with someone like me. And it's been, my experience has been fantastic, but I keep on hearing stories from other women and other designers involved in open source that I was just horrified. And I'm just wondering if something has changed recently in 
and somehow we are not capitalizing on it because of the perception that has been established. I think someone said earlier that some of the earlier groups have established certain practices and it's very difficult to, to change that now. And I think it's really true that people who decide they want to have an inclusive environment will develop an inclusive environment and people who don't make that decision won't. You know, it's variable, I think. If, if you have a, a group that has perceived itself as ha having a problem because it's male dominated, and yet wants to do something about that. And I'm thinking particularly of the very closely named FOSSI, the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation, mm -hmm. which has established the fact that it recognises that no women ever come to its meetings and that this has got to be a bad thing. What advice would you give that group? Because they actually have it as an action thing to try and work out how to broaden the diversity of the group interested in free and open source silicon design. Reach out to women. Okay, I think part of the problem they have is because it is so skewed, is actually trying to find <laughs> women, <laughs> find a woman who does silicon chip design. Yeah. There's one here. Yeah, excellent. Right. Well, that's what prompted me to ask the question. Right, well, I think we should talk afterwards. Go to, go to your local university, you know, and find, uh, you know, who's studying on the courses. But that's the problem is, on those courses, they're not. Look at well, there are a few. There are a few, but you, they're you very find, scarce. You find a few, right? You find a scarce one or two, and you invite them to give a talk, and you'll be really surprised to find that every single damn woman in the country who gives a rat's doodle about anything vaguely relating to that will be there. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I shall ask for help finding them. Yes, we'd like to know. <laughs> could, could I suggest perhaps the blindly obvious? Um, basically, obviously, you've got you, you've got a set group there, Fosbolt, and you've got Jeremy's organisation. You know. Just why not have a meeting? You know, like, it's like, they, yeah, uh, we're only about silicon chip designs. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't matter though, does it? You, you, you're, you're thinking Fossy you know, meets Flossy. Yeah, they may be about silicon chip design, but why, by, those, by those women being, you know, by women being interested vaguely in the area, you, you know, there's got to be common ground between the, between the, but there must be a, quite a bit of common ground there, you know, it's quite mm -hmm. a kind of inter, interaction, as it were. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'll talk about it. You were saying earlier on embrace diversity? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the problem. Yeah. Network yourself outside your comfort zone yeah. is one of the things on one of my slides that I did yeah. say. You know, like, yeah. like, be willing to come out of your comfort zone. And, and networks are really important because as soon as you contact a network, there is a woman sitting here who actually has the expertise that, that he has been able to find. You know? The, the whole point of diversity is networks. But you obviously you've got the transferable skills, might be quite, you know, all the rest of it, you know. So it's, it's just as soon as you start, yeah. well, what, what I can, as, as far as I can tell from, you know, talking to people who've got diversified projects and talking about how they did it, it really does seem to me that you just need to make the decision that that's what you're going to do. Reach out, find your first woman who, you know, knows anything about it and just start and a remarkably short space of time. Um, women will gravitate towards anything that welcomes them basically. It's perfect. I mean what would they, you know? You, you want to go somewhere where you feel that other people are either like you or will accept you. And, and that's that really. There's no, you know, there's, there's a variation from country to country on how many women are involved in open source. Brazil, for example, is a massive female participation. Yeah, I think mean, there's, 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 there's nothing natural about it. Oh, yeah. It's just obviously, you know, we we, we don't really want to go there. With what say, what some countries' views are about women. I mean, yeah, no, but I'm not saying. What I'm saying is that in some countries there's much higher participation than in others, yeah, yeah, and that yeah. doesn't map yeah. over how liberated women are in, in those right. countries, okay. right? There's okay. no there's there's no coextensive yeah. mapping of that. Sure, it's yeah. Brazil has a female president. Yeah. It so in that case, I think it would map to some extent. Yeah, I think that's probably, but there was also very active Linux checks for a long time in Brazil that did a lot of really good work. And also, generally, the Brazil open source community is quite leftist and humanitarian. And, and the government was actively yeah. supporting open source yes. as well. And it's, it's quite close to liberation movements and that kind of thing. So, you know, like as soon as women began to push, the doors were opened. Whereas in some other countries, um, there will be more. So we have to get the tools in your hands and shoot people and cook. Yeah. Right. So really, I think the message is that if you want more women involved, just be ready to be welcoming and reach out to women.